this now because I might have forgotten last time. All right. Okay. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Right. All right. Morning, everybody. Um, let's see. Uh, so, oh, oh boy. Whew. If you didn't know you're supposed to swish coffee around in your mouth, you get more caffeine that way. Not confident about that, but <clears throat> maybe, maybe. I will tell you this, if you didn't know um, that a light roast means that you get more caffeine. That is true, if you didn't know that. So dark roast, the more you cook a coffee bean, the more of that that you cook out of it. Um, and I'm gonna give you a secret today, even though I'm afraid it will disappear. Solar Roast, it's a brand from Colorado and they do a Peruvian coffee, a light that is the only thing I think I've voluntarily drank in the last three or four years. So Solar Roast, so they roast all the beans with the sun, for real. And it's in Colorado, they have some pretty amazing prices. It's 100% organic, but it is unbelievable, their Peru, uh, their light roast. So. That's Jason's coffee tips <clears throat> while his brain is still getting going in the morning for today. All right, any questions? Quit yawning, you're crushing me. Just kidding, all right. <laughs> it's all right, Sierra. I like the skeleton behind you. It's pretty cool. Um, Actually. What? I painted it myself. Oh, cool. My, uh, it, I know it's not a Halloween thing, it's, it's a real art thing. However, I digress to just Halloween stuff, which is my son's favorite holiday of all. He's worried that he's not gonna get to go trick-or-treating this year. Um, so we'll see what happens. I saw, I saw some really expensive things at King Super that look like, you know, self-serve candy bowls. Uh, but I saw something better on the internet where a guy from up on his porch put a tube, a candy tube, and he taped it to his railing of his steps. And then he was just plan was just to shoot candy down the tube to people that were like at least 15 feet away. So I don't know. We'll see. I think we're going to do a farm party here just so that uh, my kids can actually trick or treat. I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll make trick or treating for them <clears throat> if they can. All right, let's talk about the test. Um, looks like uh, they ended up adding a few points, I believe. Um, Severin, are you here this morning? Or I mean, uh, who's here this morning? You, uh, gosh. It's early this morning, you have to forgive me. Anyway, we added a few points because we had a couple questions um, that were kind of wonky. Um, so check announcements for that, uh, just so that you know if we ever find anything that doesn't look right or it's a repeat question or things like that, we usually go ahead and give those points back um, just to make sure that that's equitable. Nobody's perfect at writing an exam, even though all three of us or four of us or however many look at it. So. Um, was it pretty straightforward though? Was the exam pretty decent? I looked at the amount of time that people were completing it in. It did not seem like too big of a deal, but um, that being said, if it uh, was not a big deal and you did well on it, fantastic. We had good averages. Um, if you did poorly on it and this was just your first time up to bat uh, for this class, don't stress. Um, <clears throat> there's a food drive. I think I did post the link yesterday or I shared the link. The link was already posted. <laughs> excuse me, on the discussion board. I just shared it in announcements. So now you've got a food drive that you could donate to. Um, and of course, also there's Top Hat for points. Uh, and, and still, even though we're a month into it, you can still get points for clicking into Top Hat, even if it's not like five percentage points. What happens if you get Top Hat now because your grade, like you, you perceive that your grade needs it and you, and you get two extra percentage points at the end and you got like an 89 or an 88. I mean, that's again, those are actual percentage points that are added to your grade, not just like numerical 10 points, 20 points, whatever that might be. So don't stress. And if you didn't do the best, please reach out um, to your GTA and, and we can talk about it or something like that. So that's exam one, you now have exam one. And the discussion, um, if it's not, will be in there soon. We got the content grades. So here's the deal. We're in the semester, right? And this is week five, which means that at the end of this week, we'll be one third of the way through the semester, all right? So that is, we're clipping along. And I, and I, you know, I'm also teaching a class at uh, CU. I know, boo, boo. 
Trust me, we're all good. I love my students, but we'll just boo to Boulder. Boo Boulder. And if you're from Boulder, boo Boulder. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> just kidding. Um, anyway, uh, and it does not look like they're doing as well with COVID as my students here at CSU. Uh, because I've been getting emails that said, you know, they got to shut everybody down, quarantine everybody that's a student there, whether you live on campus or not. So congratulations to uh, all of my CSU students that are at least trying, you know, to do as, as well as they can. And anytime we can crush Boulder, whether it's in sports or just metaphorically, I'm fine with that. So good job, everybody. And um, let's hope that they can do better, better down in Boulder. And, and so keep, mind, keep being mindful about this. Finally, the CDC uh, admitted, not admitted, they posted on their site the other day that yes, COVID is transmitted through the air. And then several hours later, quickly redacted it. <laughs> so if there's any wonder if the CDC is just not functioning as optimally as it could, that would be it. They, I mean, finally through the air and I don't know, is it, I don't know what month this is, but it's months and months and months later, it's embarrassing. I'm teaching a class actually at Boulder on sociology of health and health indicators and health statistics and what, you know, looking across the line through a social lens at race and age and gender and things like that. So let's just say that we're not <clears throat> getting any tremendous help when it took us seven or eight months to, for the folks that have generally kept us safe and that's their job to, to even put in print that it's transmitted through the air when of course uh, everybody knew that, including the president and we know that. So Let's hope that we push forward into a safer um, and more transparent realm in regards to health, because that's what we need if we're going to beat this thing, right? All right. So the exam, uh, that's, that's already taken care of. If you have any questions, reach out to your GTAs. Um, let me see. Uh, you were doing better at COVID. Uh, just running down my things on a, on a Tuesday morning. Any questions as we move forward? Now, I don't believe the next content is due till October 9th. Um, this Thursday might be the first posting day. Uh, this is so weird to watch people in their houses, like actually get coffee and do things and have their roommates in the background. So strange. Um, anyway, uh, you, you can imagine I'm a highly distracted person in a classroom of 150 people already. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so we've got that, uh, that content is not for a bit make sure that you look at the discussion. Now, yesterday, and I, and I don't know if I did this for this class, uh, so I have it open on another window, but I went in and found the uh, on Vimeo, I think, a free link for Food Inc., not just like a trailer or something like that. So I'll make sure that I go in the discussion um, and post that there for you. So I, and it's been up there for a while. They changed the other link that I had, but that's, you know, what happens. Um, so I'll put that link up to make sure that you have free access to it. And Food Inc. is something that a lot of you have seen. Um, some of you have not, but I think it's a great starting place for the food paper, which we're going to be talking about this morning. So check that out. There's actually quite a bit on that on poultry in that movie as well, but a very different sort of a poultry theme than uh, chicken people than what we just got done doing. So before we talk um, about the paper, um, Non-denominationally, bless you, bless you, Allie. Non-denominationally, twice. Um, <laughs> I want to be as open as possible, but also bless you. Um, so you should be watching uh, and starting in on chapter four. Somebody said there might be a hang up with the video that goes black halfway through or for chapter four or something like that for one of the lectures. Um, so I'll go look at that today. And um, you know, I was really preparing for this class all summer, but I would love to do a lecture live, you know, something like that. So maybe if there's something missing on Wednesday or excuse me, on a Thursday, I'll go and look between now and then. Maybe I'll lecture on that part that was missing or something like that. Um, and maybe I'll do some breakdown lectures too this semester on specific things. It's so weird to have recorded everything, like I said, ahead of time. Um, but I'm flexible this semester and uh, I'm going to bring it all to you this semester. So I'll do some of that as well. All right. Um, any questions? Where we're at? You should be reading chapter four right now. Um, that's basically kind of where we're at. Any questions about anything up to this point? Then I want to talk about specifically the paper, the big paper that's coming up. Because just like we are now five weeks into the semester and that thing is only about five weeks away um, or six weeks away, maybe a little more, but <clears throat> that is going to be here just like that. So 
any questions about anything besides the big paper, the exam, the direction that we're heading, any social, uh, social terms or questions that you have about anything. And I'll sip some coffee for a minute, for a second. Can we ask what two questions were the two commonly missed ones? Um, yeah, but I would have to, <clears throat> let me go in there ahead of time. Unless uh, if our GTAs are with us this morning, I'd have to kind of scroll through the pages. I'm not sure if they are. Um, if any of the GTAs are here, uh, yes. Otherwise, I can go in and, and uh, maybe do that Thursday or something like that. We can talk about it. One of the classes I think had a repeat question because my exams are different from my social 100 sections. Um, I don't think there was a repeat in this section, was there? No, yeah, and, and so we're looking at rates of like, oh, 50% of the class got it right, or 40% of the class got it right. So there are ways, I mean, like I said, there's no way to make a perfect uh, multiple choice test that is actually an oxymoron and an impossibility, but you could do slightly better. So, you know, overall, okay, that being said, We'll give some points back for a couple things that were, you know, catchy or glitchy or maybe not asked in a way that was presented as clear. Um, yeah, any other questions? I'll, um, <clears throat> I'm going to have to go on this morning and do uh, the top hat questions, which I will release um, several of them. So no worries about that. I'll do that uh, right after class. Sometimes I get to ahead of time and sometimes not. I woke up at 3 a.m. last night because I heard the craziest sound. Like when you live on a farm, I don't know. It's it's not like living in the city. I, so I went outside at 3 a.m. with a flashlight. I thought I heard something weird and I was about to go out of my gate and like step onto the farm proper, even though what I heard was like an acre away. And I heard a noise. I don't know if it was something growling or something being killed or something evil being birthed into the world. I have no idea, but it was like, nah! and I was like, I immediately uh, shut the gate. <laughs> I was like, well, anyway, we'll let that sort itself out down there. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't, I haven't even gone out there this morning, but it was, I think it could be a bobcat. Bobcats sound really weird, but it was like a bobcat. I got some motion sensors over the weekend that we placed around the farm uh, and um, a couple cameras. So we're hoping to see what travels through. Um, that's El Jefe coming back. Yeah. Uh, a couple cameras uh, that, because we have a bridge. And that's like a central place for animals to cross, whether it's deer, whether it's a predator. So anyway, we'll see it. We, uh, we had a couple of sensors. That's why I was up at 3 a.m. last night, because we had a sensor that was tripped. And so I was like, ooh, I'm going to check it out. But no, I did not check it out after all. <laughs> why did I even get the sensors? I don't know. Anyway, OK. Um, any questions about where we're headed, chapter four? OK, good. So get on the discussion board. And, and so I had a couple emails this morning from other classes. It's like. How did I miss points on my discussion? Yes, you posted one week in advance of the due date, but then you posted both of them on the last day, right? That's not gonna work. If you post multiple times on one day, just make sure that you're posting on at least three different days because we will really only require three posts. Make sure that you have three posts on three different days. Anything beyond that is gravy and you're good to go, right? So yes, there were some people that missed that post a week out. If you miss that post, like, and you're, it's the next day and you're like, oh, there's only six days before the end of it, just post. Like, don't, don't say to yourself, oh, well, I missed my week in advance. No, make sure you get your post in as, as early as you can and post as often as you can for these things. These are like the super easy points, right? I mean, this is a two foot basketball rim and you get sticky gloves and I give you a trampoline and it should, it should be a slam dunk right? Each time, because these are really more opinion than anything else and watching something interesting. And I want to give you points for it. All right. So stay on top of those because in my opinion, a way to rack up easy points, you know? Um, all right. So no questions about the test, anything about chapter four or where we're headed? Nope. Okay, great. Um, all right. Let's talk now briefly for all 42 of us that are here about the paper. So I want to generate <clears throat> some ideas if you have questions about section three. Now, um, you can go in to my chapter three lecture, I think. Uh, at the beginning of that lecture, I think I have some slides that are looking at the paper and they ask questions about the paper a bit. Um, but section one, again, you can, somebody asked the other day, they said, hey, can you just get these ingredient lists? I, I, I can't go outside of my room or my dorm or whatever. Can I get my ingredient list online? Absolutely. 
So that for that first section, you need 10 foods that have ingredients and two columns, one that's conventional, non-organic, and one that's organic. So you look up spaghetti sauce, non-organic, ragu or whatever, and then your Glenn spaghetti sauce. And you write down those, that, those ingredients, that's number one. Number two could be organic mac and cheese and not organic mac and cheese. Number three, and it cannot be fruit. People are like, can I do an apple? But there's no ingredients in apples, so no. All right, so once you get those 10, then still for section one, then you'll have 10 numbers and one high fructose corn syrup, a sentence about it and a citation. Two, I don't know, methylene. Sometimes, right, there's, there's gonna be some interesting stuff in your food, like I mentioned before. So then look it up, find out, not, you're not gonna look up, not every ingredient is gonna be like insidious and horrible. And you know, it's, it's just, just identify 10 ingredients. We have to understand that the FDA, with, there was a, just a big power grab the other day at the FDA. And um, uh, we have to understand that uh, there are non-food ingredients that are allowed in your food. Chemical degreasers, um, you know, things that are in makeup. Um, all, as long as they're allowed in your food in a tiny amount, they, they can be allowed in your food. Anti-foaming agents. Anytime there's an agent in my food, I'm interested. Does that always mean it's awful? Eh, not always, but <clears throat> it's good to investigate that stuff. So that's that you can do now. For any of you who are classic uh, or professional procrastinators, I get that. I get that. Um, I was that guy. Uh, but don't do that because this has three sections and you can Google online probably ragu and its ingredients. You can Google online an organic you know, mac and cheese ingredients thing. If you do go to the store, just walk around with your phone because in King Super, it's like, here's the ragu, poof, halfway down the aisle, there's the organic, poof. There's the, the fake Captain Crunch, Panda Puffs or whatever it is, and there's the, you know, you know what I'm saying? So that should be easy. You can do that now, and it, it, you, it doesn't really require, you know, yeah, go on the King Super's website, absolutely. Um, hire somebody through Instacart to take the risk your, themselves. <laughs> Uh, anyway, all right. Okay, so let's break it down. Let's get to the food paper here. And section three, I say cultural section, but really section three is a section where you get creative, okay? So what I want to know here, we're trying to avoid things. In two pages, we're trying to avoid things like eating disorders, obesity, things that people have written dozens and dozens of books and have documentaries over and things like that. Yes, those are meaningful. I'm not saying they're not but I think that we can find some interesting things. So I'm gonna bring up something yesterday that came up in a class meeting to start this conversation that I think is really interesting. Now, what we're trying to get here to is like some interesting piece of sociology, okay? And so what is it that makes whatever about the food thing that you wanna write about interesting? Okay, so, so here's something, right? The, and I think we mentioned this before. It looks like a small child's head. Is that the head of a small child? Hey, what's up, dude? Looks like he's going to be a proud ginger. Yes, excellent. Good. Uh, no, I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. But super cute. Um, and so what about people that want to eat vegetarian or vegan, and that's their dedication, but then they seek out a burger that is meant to taste like flesh, right? Like, what about that? Is the Impossible Burger safer than? less ingredients than, less stress on the environment than like a real hamburger. And how? Because I think that there are all sorts of ways to look at this. And yes, you know, the real hamburger piece would be, I think a pound of beef takes 2000 liters of water. So, right, there are, there are some important things to look at. But to me, the interesting thing about that is not that people want a fake burger. I mean, I'm 47 right now. Guys like me are dying of heart disease from eating too much and colon cancer from eating too much meat. And so maybe it's that somebody is looking for an alternative, but what's like, why, or what's that about? I just think that's interesting. Here's another thing. Um, families of people that hunt, right? You know, like actually people that are going out and getting or killing their food for sustenance. What's that mean to somebody, to a family? What's it mean ooh, to a person that's a vegetarian living in a family of hunters? right? Or something like that. To me, that's really interesting. And then here's the one that we stumbled on yesterday. And somebody was talking about slaughtering chickens. And I didn't get any broiler chickens this year. <clears throat> but, you know, a few years back, 
Hey, Storm. Uh, uh, the, <laughs> that, that is the exact answer that a 15 year old gives you in the morning when you say, Hey storm, Hey storm. Okay. Talk to you later, bro. Hey, see ya. Um, anyway, what about if, if you've never, like you've never processed an animal before, what about calling somebody like there's a, an old feed store in Laporte and the guy there, Greg, um, knows when a lot of people are going to be slaughtering their chickens. And sometimes they do it over at his place. You get the metal cones and you slit the, you know, the necks and stuff. What if you've never done that and you write that last two pages on, I'm going to go do that. Like sociology can be something that you participate in. So what if you join somebody in processing their chickens and write about the experience? You know, I'm not saying everybody wants to do it. But I brought both boys um, three years ago down there. We had 30 hens to process. And uh, my 12-year-old, Zion, with uh, you know, the blonde dreadlocks, that kid, the young guy, um, he is like a fan of, you name it, uh, Friday the 13th, and like any horror movie he's into. And he was processing chickens for about an hour. And he's like, I think I'm going to go sit down. And I'm like, why, man? And he's like, well, there's a little more blood than I thought. <laughs> Like, I was like, okay, bros, go ahead, go sit down. Um, but what if you've never done that and you write about that experience? So, okay, um, I know that's a little extreme, but not all that extreme. I mean, if you're going to the store or to a chicken place and eating chicken, it has eyes, it has a life. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever seen that? So, okay, so you could, that just, those topics that I just said right now, I just want you to know that that's how you could open this thing up to something really interesting you know, for that last part. So does anybody have an idea, uh, a thought about what they want to do, a question if it's, if something like an idea is a good idea for that last section, the kind of the creative section, anybody have any, or questions to me, is this a good idea? Or maybe somebody goes hunting for the first time. I've never gone hunting. My dad went hunting once, said he bought a 22, went hunting with his friend, his friend shot a deer, it took him forever to die, and my dad gave his rifle to this guy, and that was it. He did it once, I've never even been hunting. I've killed 30 chickens, but I've never gone out, you know, to do that, so maybe it's something like that, I don't know. <clears throat> Section two is about organic farming and agriculture, con uh, conventional farming and agriculture, and what that looks like. It's really a research piece, so we're just gonna skip that for now. now we'll look at that later. Um, Questions or, or thoughts, questions for me, ideas that you have. Like if you're like, I don't know, I was thinking about this. Is it a good idea? Let's talk about it. And I'll drink some coffee while, while you get ready. Um, I was thinking I could do like environmental impacts of being a vegetarian because I'm a vegetarian and I became a vegetarian for different reasons but I find that also really interesting uh do you mind if I ask why you became a vegetarian yeah no for sure I don't mind um I watched a lot of documentaries mm -hmm. and I'm very connected to animals and I've always been connected to animals and one of my friends became vegan so I was like oh I could try it out and then it was like three years went by and a lot of the documentaries provided like a research basis for why I became a vegetarian because like health wise and everything. I was like, wow, meat's kind of wacky, especially like <laughs> red meat and stuff. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so here's a thought. Like the environmental impacts of going vegetarian, you know, or vegan. Yeah, right? Like, yeah, yeah, it's a big paper. That's a book, in fact, right? So like, how could you take that or your journey into vegetarianism and maybe talk to other people that, I mean, could you get somebody to try it for a week? You know, one of your friends, could you convince one of your friends to try and eat like you for a week or go vegetarian, somebody that eats meat, you know, something, and then talk about their experience or I don't know, um, or maybe focus in on like, how many people, like when you watch a documentary, because there are so many good ones, um, and, and a lot now that, that show the science of it. Um, uh, oh, Forks Over Knives is a really good one. Um, like, do documentaries change people's minds? Or, or do they really 
you know, have an impact on people long term. I don't know. Do you know what I mean, Gabby? Like maybe there's something, yeah. maybe there's something like interesting about somebody that, that you know that chose to be a vegetarian or somebody that you think wouldn't at all, but you could convince them for a week to try. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of what could be a little more interesting than, than the environmental impacts. Not that that's not interesting or pick one. Like find an environmental impact of being vegetarian that is really pronounced that you feel is really important. How's that sound? I have another idea. Like, what about like financially? Is it actually cheaper to be like vegetarian than it is to be like a meat eater? Like, technically? Okay. See, I like this. I'm digging on this because I think that something that like keeps people from doing. Okay, so this kept me from being organic. Here's the deal Julia was working at Vitamin Cottage for a long time. And a storm was born. And about six months into him being a baby, you know, they're like, uh, and they just kind of hang out for a long time, like these little blobs. And we were feeding him nothing but organic food that we were making ourselves, that we were buying at the store. And we looked at each other, right? We knew this. We knew that we have this life to take care of and that we didn't want to feed it food that was compromised early with pesticides, with any of that overproduction. So about six months into that, I looked across the dinner table at her and I said, how come we don't eat all organic? And Julie said, I get a discount. I work at the store and you still complain about how little groceries we get. And I was like, oh, oh yeah. So I was like, okay, well, I'll stop doing that. She's like, right. Okay. But I did. I just stopped doing that. Like I stopped complaining about it. And what I realized is people spend about the same amount of money to buy a whole giant grocery cart full of garbage right? As they do overall to go buy really quality food. But when you're buying quality foods, you're buying less of it. You're not in the waste mentality mode anymore. You're in the specific kind of ingredient mode. And, and it, it just, it's a bit different. So I stopped complaining. And immediately within six months, I had lost 25 pounds for doing nothing. You have to understand I'm a teacher. So I lift whiteboard markers and erasers. That's my workout at my job. It's pathetic, right? So I'm not somebody who's a workout person, but I immediately uh, lost 25 pounds because of not as many sugars, not as many highly processed sugars, not as much corn in my food. And I was blown away. Um, so maybe somebody looks at why price keeps people away from that, like you said, and is it really all that much more expensive to eat organically? Or is that just something that we, it's a mental habit formation. We think it is, we think it is, we think it is, but we've never really, right? That's what I was doing. I was just saying it was, I was saying it was, I was saying it was. I had no frame of reference. I had no data that I had collected. I didn't go shopping for a, a month straight organically and compare. You know, I was just on that tip. So what about if you can look at, is it really more organic? Or is, does it save you money to be a vegetarian by a lot besides? I don't know. I think that when looking at money, a lot of people make their decisions on what they put into their body, like a dollar decision. Maybe I'm going to make at see now, and I get it. I get it at 18. At 47, I'm like, that's more important to me than ever. Because you're not thinking at 18 about <clears throat> how, how close you are to dying. Not that I am at 47, but it's like, whatever. And your body's really resilient. But, but I think the, the older you get, the more you're like, how can, I, how can I be healthier? How can I be safer? How can I? So yeah, um, barriers, money barriers. Is that a reality? Is it a myth? Um, yeah. What about the benefits of having a meatless Monday? We could look at that. There's, there's data about that. Sure. Maybe, um, again, I think it would be interesting if, uh, if you had a friend that was, the, I mean, when I ask people how many meals do they eat meat for in a given week? I mean, there's a large percentage of people that have meat with almost every single meal, and I have quite a bit of meat myself. So it's like, could you get somebody that does to not do that for a week or two, look at their savings, talk to them about what it was like? I don't know. You know, anyway, whole foods equal money uh, or whole paycheck. Yeah. And again, again, maybe, maybe. Um, I'm thinking of doing my paper on the effects of non-organic food consumption on newborn babies and how it may affect development. Uh, yeah, I think, I think it's interesting or you could look at, I mean, newborns are mostly just drinking milk. However, they are finding not only in the amniotic fluid, but in breast milk, like dozens of pesticides 
uh, and dozens of, um, of things like that. And, and not only, this is pre-birth in the amniotic sac and the fluid, and this is post-birth in the mother's milk, even for people that eat really, really healthily so that their breast milk is, you know, as, as healthy as possible. So you might look at that, like how do pesticides find their ways into people's bodies? Because when we look at pesticides, it's not just what you're eating. We have to understand that. If it was just what you're eating, that's one thing. I think that's how people think of it. But it's the places around you that live that are spraying the stuff on the lawn. And it's the phones and the furniture that's coated in the anti or the flame retardant stuff and, and has arsenic in the motherboard and flakes off in your pot. It's like, it's the cumulative effect of a pesticide filled sort of society when we look at that. So, you know, maybe you could look at studies that are looking at how how moms um, protect their newborns and how they can avoid poisons or pesticides or stuff like that. I don't know if people have done that, but that could be a really interesting thing for sure. Um, so this is more of a research paper than the kind of how we eat and perceive food. Well, number one is collecting data. Number two, section two is looking specifically at organic and conventional farming. And then section three could be anything. Um, but of course, for section three, you're going to need research as well. And whether that's research and data that you collect, uh, combine it with other data, like I said, I, I always think it's interesting if you can talk to somebody, interview somebody, give a questionnaire, set of questionnaires or surveys that are really quick about eating habits or about anything like that. It's always cool to, to pull people in in your own way or data. And now I think you can go online and design, you know, surveys that you don't have to hand out by paper that you could email to your family or whoever if you're trying to get to a certain topic or answer questions or get some feedback. Could a topic be about social pressures surrounding vegans, people trying to live in alliance or moral beliefs, ideal health? Sure. A lot of people just eat to survive and don't even think about that relationship. And so they do put social pressures. When somebody says, I'm vegan, I mean, how many people really want to raise their hand and say that in front of a bunch of people? And if you don't, then that has to do with social pressure and that has to do with sociology. And that has to do with perceptions of what it means to be a vegan or what it means to be a vegetarian. And it has to do how the meat producers of the United States and the Dairy Council have tried super hard to get people full of milk and meat and have that trajectory. What happens if you don't do that? Are you un-American? Is it somehow go against our values and ideals and beliefs? Um, you know, I think that's, again, I think that there's some interesting stuff in there to stand up and be avidly or or quite uh, against meat or eating meat is like still in 2020 i think it's um i think those decisions are more supported but i think there's some interesting stuff about that about why people would react so vehemently about that something like that no all right other questions what do you think oh think about writing about my experience of trying to fake meat eat fake meat for the first time sierra is that, okay uh, is that an okay idea? <clears throat> well, you could certainly write about your own perspective, but you might want to buy some fake meat, meat and make it for other people or buy it and give it to them to make and then have them, because really cooking for people now is like probably not the greatest thing, right? Um, but yeah, buy the meat, the fake meat for them, have them cook it and have them write a survey about their experiences and then ask them questions about it. And you're going to get people that are like, whoa, yeah, I guess if it's going to taste like that, I don't need to kill a cow. And you're going to have people that are going to be like, that was nothing like meat. You are offending my barbecue sensibilities in every single way. So, right? Okay. I meal prep with my boyfriend every week and we both eat meat. But my best friend is vegetarian. Is it a good idea to grocery shop and meal prep with her to compare cost? Sure. You could do that. Yeah. Comparative shopping with the, like, you're going to shop for your meals for so many days. She shops for hers. And then you look at it. And then don't tell her, but look at the ingredients afterwards. Because I'm going to suggest that some of these burgers where even the yeast is genetically modified or they put a bunch of tofu in, which might not be good estrogen for men and those levels. I'm going to suggest that a lot of people that are vegetarian or vegan eat processed, they are processed vegans or they are processed vegetarians. So they are eating food that is so heavily processed instead of just salad and nuts and berries and like the raw stuff that is it. But they're trying to kind of end around, you know, do you know what I'm saying here? Like, like there is, you could be vegetarian or vegan and be eating so much more processed foods um, that it's, that it's like, 
not going to be accomplishing the goal that you want to accomplish. So I think that would be really interesting um, as well. And that's not like calling BS on that stuff. That's just like, how does somebody go about veganism or vegetarianism versus somebody else? Like, is there a really actual healthy and more mindful, meaningful way to go about it? Um, yeah. Of course, you have access to the school. You have people that buy and sell food for you. They get food contracts for you. Um, the student senate votes on those food contracts. You could talk to people that are there about why they had fruit that was organic for a long time. And then when they change prices around, why, why they don't or what their plans are to incorporate more vegan or vegetarian items. Go to talk to people. And I mean, talk to them, you know, interview them by phone. These people have a job and they got to be at CSU you know, for however many hours, a lot of times they're available, you know, to do an interview with or something like that. So I also think that would be interesting. All right, other thoughts, um, ideas that you might have. I, are you starting to get a better idea now of what I'm looking for with section three or, you know, how at least we find some sociologically interesting things. Again, it's just not that interesting to do topics that you've heard about a bunch that people have done a ton of, you know, research in already. It's anything that we could look at somebody has likely looked into. That being said, I think there's always an interesting sociological way to go about it. Cook dinner every night, don't generally buy organic ingredients. Uh, what about doing a two week process where I make my normal menu and then follow, I could make the same foods using organic ingredients, compare the costs. I mean, yeah, that'd be cool. You know, don't just compare the costs though, right? Yeah, take notes, two, two weeks is not gonna be a tremendously long amount of time. That being said, let me tell you what, food tastes different. I'm gonna tell you what, if you love food, that's why I'm, that's why really, there's a couple of reasons why I eat almost all organic and don't eat out very often and don't dabble in danger, what I consider to be dangerous foods. That is, it tastes better. Have you ever had a really quality organic cheese versus whatever else they call cheese that is pre-shredded? Pre-shredded, I'm too old to talk about that this morning. I'm gonna chase pre-shredded cheese off my lawn. Somebody put some muscle into it and get going already. Sorry, I digress. <laughs> but it tastes better. Like meat that doesn't have that, the pink stuff or that's been so highly, you really think a pound of meat, non-organic meat is worth three or four bucks. It is worth so much more than that. What do they have to cut it with? What do they have to do? What conditions must it be in to get it to market and process it at that cost? It's, it doesn't even begin to reflect what the farmer does. How about talking to a farmer? I mean, I know I'm musician, teacher, um, farmer, the three least paying you know, professions ever, right, in one trifecta. But what about just calling a farmer or somebody with a local CSA and being like, why do you farm? Why do you want the stress of growing food for other people? I mean, I grow a ton of food in my garden, but I don't have people relying on me to do that. That's intense, you know, like, like why do you do that? So <clears throat> again, I think that, yeah, that would be cool. Um, and, and you will notice in a, in a two week thing like that, you're gonna notice things, you might not notice your weight drop, but you're gonna be like, wow, I've never had a better burger or I've never had cheese that's as good or that apple is totally different, I wouldn't have guessed. Um, or I ate a cereal that tastes exactly the same as Captain Crunch, except it has half the ingredients. Uh, that seems like a win or or I tried something organic, it was twice as expensive, it was total bullshit, and, and, and it tasted awful. I don't know, right? It could go many different ways. So, excuse me, sorry about that, sorry about that. <laughs> as, if, as if my college students haven't heard swearing before. Well, anyway, that's usually like 90% of my lexicon, and it's, my, it's at least 98% of my dad's total whatever words come out of his mouth still. Just, he can string swear words together like, People ballet dance. I don't know, it's a thing of beauty. <laughs> All right, what other questions for topics do you have before we're done here today? Um, I'll release the top hat questions in a bit, but I do wanna make sure, um, yeah, that, that, that if you have an idea and you wanna bounce it off everybody here so that we all generate an idea, you get to say that. So what do you think? Um, this is just like a general question. Mm -hmm. So it's part three more that we do like our own like research within like people like we talk to or can we get like or does that have to be like or can we do it just like from like sources online and stuff like that i'm only suggesting that you reach out to people or processes that you know or do something interesting because i think it would be a lot more fun 
That being said, no, you don't have to do your own survey or, or research, uh, uh, meaning you don't have to create something new. You could look at something like weightlifting and how those people pack on protein and is that good for people, is it not? What's that subculture look like? You really can do anything. And in part three, although you collect some data, I want you to reference it to social terms. I want you to reference it to things that other people have done, other research. You're gonna have to have some research in that section that you didn't create as well to connect it. But again, it's only two pages, you know, and that goes fast. Uh, it really does. And that's two pages single space. I should tell people that because two pages double space is like, I mean, you know, you've already, like, it takes, it doesn't take any time to write that. And I know that people are used to being, they're, they're used to being formatted into double spaced. And, and I do ask for different requirements sometimes because I'm weird or I don't know, whatever. Um, all right. I'm interested in dumpster diving. Freeganism, dumpster diving. I spent uh, the weekend 15 years ago or so with my friend on the streets of Chicago, um, and we just were homeless for the weekend. We chose to be homeless for the weekend. I wouldn't recommend um, it from a safety perspective, um, but I but it was enlightening and it was important. Um, and so for those, we did four days. And so for those four days, we ate strictly out of stuff that we got from dumpsters. Um, and behind grocery stores and supermarkets and things like that. There's a whole subculture of people that do that. Um, and yes, now, 20 years later, 15 years later, people are locking dumpsters and they're kind of keeping people from that waste so that they can throw it away. Uh, but food waste is an extremely interesting and important thing for us to consider in regards to our relationship with food. My Social 220 class, my environmental sociology class does a, 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 a paper on food waste. And it's really interesting. So, yeah, what about trying to dumpster dive for a weekend around town? Obviously, Fort Collins is a lot different and safer in ways than Chicago. Um, what's that look like? The other part of that is social justice. There are people that believe that it is more just to climb a fence and take food that's about to rot that was processed than it is to let food rot in the, uh, than to throw it away. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not telling people to take that risk and get arrested. I'm just saying that um, it, it, is, it is an interesting way to look at it. And I think that there are a lot of folks that get a whole year's worth of meat for their freezer uh, in a handful of weeks um, doing dumpster diving and things like that. There are people that, that, that live on it. And if you look at the price of groceries, uh, not just organic groceries, like that's what they always say, organic costs so much. The whole thing is going like this. All your crappy food too, Still going up. Crappy food, still expensive, even though it's filled with crappity crap crap. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think that that would be interesting. Yeah, anything with freeganism or dumpster diving or an examination into that lifestyle, why people would do it or what that's about. And of course, you know, I'm not telling people to eat things out of dumpsters. Science is real. Um, bacteria is real. Temperatures and food prep science is real, right? You know? That's actually the best thing I've seen about masks. It's, it was that restaurant thing that's like, yeah, it's okay if you don't wear a mask in here. That's your choice. As long as you don't mind that we exercise our choice not to wash the food and to not cook it to the correct temperature. No problem. <laughs> we'll all be exercising free choice in our graves. Good luck. Oh, goodness. All right. What do you got for me before we're done? Because I'm pretty done. I always get meat from a farmer in Nebraska, and it lasts us a whole year. Yeah, uh, sometimes I've gone out to Sylvandale. Sylvandale Ranch in Loveland does organic beef and other things like that. We have uh, went in on a, a few years ago, we went in with another couple and we each purchased like half a cow with each other to save money on that or whatever that was. Um, talk to that farmer, yeah. Does this have to be like the process of food and organic, non-organic? Can we do socially eating? How some people may be feeling uncomfortable eating in front of others? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, section two is research and organic and non-organic, but section three could be People feeling uncomfortable eating in front of others. Yeah, I'm uncomfortable eating in front of or with my kids because of the noises that they make. <laughs> and or I know like, that that sounds weird, but like, that's why I kind of want to like, I don't know. I thought it'd be kind of like a better like sociology point of view for this. Cause like, um, I know people that like when we go out to eat and stuff are like, go out to lunch or anything they like don't get anything or like they wait till they're home and stuff like that so I just kind of want to do like a little bit more into that and it's not an eating disorder thing 
they don't want to eat at all. It's just that some people don't like eating in front of other people. Yeah. Wow. Sure. I don't like to watch people eat, so I get it. Like, like commercials where people are eating the food that they're selling, that's the worst way to sell me on that food. I yeah, do not exactly. Watch <laughs> I do not want to watch you ingest that gross stuff. Anyway, yeah, sure, I think that'd be interesting. Yeah, I wonder if there's a, um, there is. I wonder what that is called. Right? Yeah, I'll, I'll do more research into it, but I just thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah, my wife is uh, self-conscious eating in front of me, but interesting. Yeah, I I get it. And I also think it's it's got that piece that's really interesting, you know. What's a good topic to correlate with hunting? Um, there's a ton. Start off with the fact that 90-some percent of our population does not go out and kill its food to get that food to eat. Um, and of course, there are certain cultures, and of course, we did forever and ever and ever, humans, um, you know, engaging in that behavior. But now what's, it's so very different. Actually, our food system in the last 70, 80 years has been so different than any time in previous history for human beings. We are now seeing what unfettered access to everything, anytime, all the time, production, it's on. This is a very tiny window in history, folks, where right now, one of my students that lives on the East Coast is like, I don't want to eat lobster here. I only eat lobster that I order and less than 24 hours later, because I used to live in Maine, it's delivered to my door. What? You can get a kumquat from someplace in the middle of the jungle that King Julian picked. I don't know. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what is it about our world food system? Because I guarantee you being able to have anything all the time, anywhere, that's just a, this is a very tiny window that we're talking about right now as far as access. So I think that's interesting. So I don't know, hunting, anything involved with hunting. I particularly think it would be interesting if somebody was raised in a hunting family that did not hunt or that was veganism or vegetarian, vegetarian or maybe that's kind of obvious. I don't know. Mm, uh, gender and hunting. I think we have certain gender expectations about hunting. You know, so kind of the lens that we look through any of these social topics are through, we could apply to this, you know, in, in a way. All right. Anybody else before we wrap it up here? Yeah, um, I wanted to add on to the uncomfortable eating in front of people situation. Um, that's something I, that I was thinking about, too, because I exist in a larger body and I feel that way. A lot of people see me eating in public. I feel really judged and I feel super weird about it. Yeah. And I've heard a lot of other plus size people say similar things. And I think it's interesting that though food is like a survival necessity for people, it, there's so much there's so there's almost like this moral judgment about it nope. depending on what you look like when you're eating it. So I um, wonder. Yeah. Too. That's why I was curious because it's almost like a social pressure type thing. And like, um, I have had some friends that have like struggled with food and like all that stuff. But um, I don't know. I've just had quite a bit of friends where like we'll go out to eat or something and they just never order anything or they're like, it's okay. I'm just going to wait till I get home. But right. that's why I was just really interested in it. You know, and a heads up to anybody. If, if you think that you're going to talk to somebody with a possible eating disorder, you know, that's that part about when we're talking about research and keeping people safe and knowing what you're talking about ahead of time and letting them know what's going on and the types of questions you're going to ask them. I mean, yeah, there are all sorts, there's all sorts of that, all sorts of function related around food and all sorts of dysfunction related around food. And I think that as a sociologist, we want to examine all of that but we got to do so in a way um, that that's like sense. respectful and not, you know, scaring them with all these research questions. Yeah. I mean, those folks that don't want to eat in front of other people, that's, that could be a really intense thing or it could just be a, I don't want to get food on me or look gross eating. I, you know, it could be a, a deep thing. Yeah, exactly. It could not be. Um, yeah. Interesting. It's, 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 wow. See, so many, so, so everything is so that's why I love it. Every, everything is sociology. Everything. Um, yeah, I just got a text that says, miss you already. It's my anniversary today. 19 years married, 25 years together. 25 years? I know. Can you believe that? Wow. Uh, that's Aww, a happy long... anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, I'll take that. I'll take that because uh, anybody who's ever been in a relationship knows how hard that is to maintain for a week. I don't know, you know, let alone 25 years. We dated for six years first because neither one of us was interested in, you know, marriage or whatever. I love the Princess Bride. That's all I can think of. Um, so, yeah, she misses me already. I told her to skip out on work early. I'm 47. She's 42. I'm telling her, skip work. Come home. Let's hang out. Your job sucks. Let's do this. <laughs> I, I might even call in sick for her. I don't know. Maybe when I get off the phone, I'll, I'll tell her that like a, a coyote is eating a chicken and she needs to come home quick and save it. I don't know. Nah, probably just need to lie to her employment, tell her she has a headache and then come on home or something. I'm going to do it though. I'm going to do it. All right. Uh, anybody else? Anybody else? Anything else? Tell her El Jefe is back. Oh no. No, I don't want to give her that kind of hope. I, I, I could go call her management and be like, El Jefe has returned. Tell Julie to come home. <laughs> Just something really cryptic, really weird. Uh, that'd be great. Um, and then hang up. Nick. Yes. Well, all right. Um, the Cameron Peak fire starting to rage again. Uh, picked up a lot yesterday. Uh, folks that we have, friends in Red Feather, um, having to evacuate. Uh, the farm is like a militarized zone with helicopters coming and going all the time because from Laporte, I kind of look and I can see Horsetooth, you know, the reservoir from over here and it's, it's been nonstop. So, um, you know, let's put our positive energy uh, in the direction of people that are fighting those fires. I think 20 some firefighters came down over the weekend with COVID or were tested positive for COVID, making this situation and scenario even more difficult because um, we have 700 some people up there fighting these fires. So yeah, um, yep. And I will tell you this every single day until it's uh, the election, register to vote, register to vote, register to vote. Um, again, such a low percentage of people in your age group voted last time. Don't, don't do that. Exercise your democratic muscle and vote, okay? Look at that, crushing it. That's because I voted. <laughs> I'm swole because I voted. Hmm. Is there, there, did anybody see the Paul, oh, Paul Rudd, is it Paul Rudd? Yeah, did anybody see that? Did I talk about that, that video where he's like, he's like trying to appeal to millennials? If you haven't seen that Paul Rudd video, it's still in my head because I kind of do that all the time with my students. I, I find outdated terms that I know make me sound uncool on purpose and then use them. I do that with my teenagers all the time too, just to drive them crazy. But uh, anyway, um, please register to vote and have a say in um, your future. Uh, and I am not begging you to vote uh, Green Party or Republican or Democratic. And again, um, you know, that's not my gig is to tell you what to do in regards to who to vote for, but look at issues and you can see statistically, we can say, does somebody care about the environment? Well, let's look at their voting record, right? Does somebody care about women and gender issues truly? Look at the voting record. Let's look at behavior. Let's put our behavior where our mouth lies and look at what the behavior is of the people that you will or will not vote for. And oftentimes I don't like the idea of voting against something you need to look and find out what there is to vote for and educate yourselves and then do that. Do it, do it, do it. Register, register, register. And I know there's probably people in my classes that are like, Jason's trying to get me to vote for the Democratic candidate. No, I've had so many disclaimers this semester. You know that that's not the case, okay? Just get busy doing your job. One of your jobs is to wear your mask. Other one of your jobs is to do your school business. Another job is to be good people and do good things. And yet another job is to vote, okay? So there's a register to vote link from Sophie. Thank you so much. I appreciate that link. Go out there. And, and if you have friends that are cynical, that are like, yeah, my vote doesn't matter, just tell them that people who are older than them that don't believe that they have much value are just fine with them not voting. How that, like if somebody would have said that to me, if I didn't care about voting at 18 and I was super cynical about it, which I was, and somebody was like, well, that's just what they want. I'd be like, oh no, you don't, right? Then I'd go out and <laughs> I'd go out and vote just to make sure that they don't have the satisfaction of blowing off my age group, right? Because right now they listen to my age group. I'm the one out there. My age group is the one out there buying things. That's why they come out 
with fantastic toys. That's right. That's a six inch. Yeah, 40th anniversary Empire Strikes Back Han Solo and Carbonite. This is why they make it, because they, they want to cater to me right now. But while they're catering to my generation, they are absolutely blowing off your generation in ways. And that's not party lines. That's, that's all sorts of Republicans, all sorts of Democrats, all sorts of people that are undeclared by age. Don't think that you have that much to contribute. Please prove them wrong. Do that for, do that for me or for yourselves, would you? All right, we're out of here. Be good people and do good things. Take care, everybody. I'll see you on Tuesday. Tuesday. Thank you. Yep. Take care.